Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Andrea, for um, the introduction and uh, having me again. Um, so, as you said, we will talk about um, interfaces and perovskites, uh, heterostructures, um, uh, maybe a little bit to see on uh, uh, what we define as this for uh, perovskite devices. Um, finally, however, I really want to begin with um, some uh, characterization because uh, a tool that we, uh, in particular, I used a lot is a photoelectron photo emission spectroscopy. Um, and I want to um, uh, give you a little bit of uh, groundwork on this to um, acquaint you better with this uh, technique. So um, let's start it off with a statement that is wrong, <coughs> and that is halide perovskites. It is all about um, the interfaces. So I start with this preface because uh, we have seen now that PV technology, um, particularly so thin film PV technology, is focused on um, the, um, uh, the, the uh <coughs> how to say, the optimization of um, the interfaces involved in the device, and it becomes uh, even more prevalent as you go to multi-junction devices. Now, this is the general overview of um, the talk. We will have this interface surface science uh, section in the beginning. We will then um, discuss in broad length on how one could use techniques in order to um, determine um, energy level alignment, uh, particularly for hybrid uh, semiconductors. Um, and then eventually we will move on to um, halide perovskites and is it really all about the interfaces? Well, I will present a few um, recent examples of work that, uh, that has been done <coughs> uh, under my supervision or that I did uh, uh, personally, but we will see um, this one here might, we might uh, run a little bit short in time for this um, and it's a, a rather conference level um, concepts. Now um, let's move to um, interfaces and uh, surface science for PV. Um, and uh, in order to um, underline on how interfaces are so important for perovskites, I want to take um, uh, this slide here. So this is not in your booklet. Uh, well, it is, but not in this talk. We uh, did not spend a lot of time on this uh, yesterday. So I actually want to um, reiterate it in order to, to really bring across the point uh, what interfaces can do to a perovskite device. Um, essentially, what we did here in order to get to this um, uh, exceptional um, uh, operational stability was to um, keep the uh, perovskite absorber the same. So it's always the triple cation mixed halide perovskite absorber uh, or from medium methyl ammonium cesium. But <coughs> we first changed the whole transport material, going from this um, spiral method. Uh, organic molecule. Remember, we talked a little bit about organic electronics uh, yesterday to um, this more simple EH uh, molecule that is abbreviated EH44 uh, and is more dense, thus also uh, has a lower permeability for moisture and also metal um, uh, um, ions. Then also we um, exchanged the top contact from um, gold to molybdenum oxide and aluminum. This makes um, a, um, a contact that uh, builds up an aluminum oxide uh, between those two um, participants that is again impermeable for aluminum um, atoms going into the perovskite layer where um, all sorts of chemistry can happen but more on this later on. And then the, the third part is to um, change the titanium oxide at the bottom to tin oxide which is a uh, lower um, uh, photocatalytic um, uh, activity. And um, this really made a change and I want to um, uh, highlight the change between the titanium oxide electron transport layer and the tin oxide electron transport layer. Uh, what I show you here are um, time of flight secondary ion mass spectrometry curves. So these are depth profiles. Uh, you um, dig with your primary ion, uh, primary ion beam through your layer and you collect the secondary ions and thus reconstruct uh, what sort of materials were in this layer that you are currently uh, digging out. Um, this gives you this convoluted graph over here where you have this butter time that is uh, not completely equivalent, but corresponding to the um, uh, depth that you are uh, in your sample. Uh, starting off with the gold, and then you see all the different uh, components from the perovskite solar cell. And if you now look into um, this set of curves here, where you have the titanium oxide electron transport layer, um, and you compare the black curve, that is the fresh cell as prepared, to the orange curve, and this is now the cell that has been operated uh, for a day, you can see that there are differences here for the formamidinium um, distribution and also for the cesium contribution particularly. Um, and now if you move to the tin oxide electron transport layer and rerun the same experiment, you see that these changes are absent. So changing this bottom interface had an effect of um, the cation redistribution throughout the entire perovskite layer. This is probably seeded by degradation mechanism at the titanium oxide perovskite interface. Um, the, the absolute details on this degradation we don't have yet, but um, to sh uh, we were able to show this effect and to eliminate it. 
And um, what does it mean now for devices? So uh, of course, this is the big question. We are uh, PV school here. Uh, and <coughs> let me um, start off with this uh, novel organic coal transport material and the top electrode. Here we saw the most impact on the long-term stability. So initially, we had this drop about 20% of the efficiency. Um, and then for the spiral omitad layer, you could see that there is an um, enduring drop uh, over uh, hundreds of hours, uh, 100 hours. Whereas with the EH44, you could really stabilize the strength and keep the stability at this initially diminished value. Now, we know already from the top sims that I showed that this drop comes or is related to uh, redistribution of the ions. Um, and this was again shown here. When um, here now, these are uh, efficiency over time, so uh, stability assessment. Uh, you compare the blue curve, this is the titanium oxide ETL, where you have this drop, so this corresponds to the uh, orange curve over here, and then the red curve for the tin oxide layer, where we first have an increase in efficiency, it's a uh, light uh, soaking effect, and then this remarkable stable um, device power output uh, over a thousand of hours, again without any encapsulation or other precaution taken for the cell. Uh, here you see the uh, relative humidity levels, of course, so this was done at Enver, uh, in Colorado where it's not very uh, dry. So um, if you want to make good perovskite cells, I can uh, uh, run recommendations, build your lab in a place that is <laughs> has a relatively dry environment. Um, uh, this certainly helped. <coughs> and um, as I said, the Champion device had these optimized interfaces and retained its peak efficiency, 94% uh, of its peak efficiency after a thousand hours. Now, um, I want to go back a little bit to the basics because what I haven't covered there yet is um, Sure, some chemical impact of those interfaces, but what is actually the electronic alignment? Do we, um, uh, do we have means uh, to um, tailor those interfaces to even improve performance from the get-go, uh, make essentially better band diagrams as uh, they have been uh, drawn before? Um, and I want to uh, touch on a few points here that has been the topic of yesterday's uh, presentation. So it's, uh, uh, it's really a shortcut. It's uh, particular when you compare it to Uwe's slides, it's um, embarrassingly uh, uh, simplified, but uh, let's uh, walk through it. The general aims are, of course, efficiency, reliability, and scalability. The shock requires a limit. Uh, we, we have the five points. Of, I want to pick up the three here that we have a one electron hole pair per photon that we have thermal relaxation of the electrons that are generated, the free carriers, and that we use um, non-concentrated um, sunlight. So there are, of course, a few workarounds, and these workarounds had been presented by um, Uwe uh, yesterday, uh, namely the multi-junction cell, um, hot carrier extraction. Again, I think we will hear more on this on uh, Friday, um, as well as for um, photon conversion. Now, um, if we look into um, this uh, view graph here, um, the, 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 this indicating the shockley quasar limit for um, uh, converting um, incident uh, light power into electricity. Uh, so this is the graph we have really in detail discussed yesterday. Uh, and the primary uh, uh, figure of merit here is, of course, the band gap that you can tune and that you want to align in order to be in this range um, where you still have a lot of uh, thermalization. So the workaround has been this uh, tandem uh, cell where you um, absorb in different parts of the um, uh, uh, emitted um <coughs> spectrum from the sun. Um, and then, of course, here the um, hot carrier kinetics. So if you could um, eliminate the thermalization process and uh, extract carriers as they are hot, um, this is actually a process that is also somewhat relying on um, uh, the context because you don't want to have heat dissipation uh, in the context, even if you turn off um, heat um, channels in your device or thermalization channels. Um, then you can harvest um, a higher uh, amount of uh, light into, efficient, um, into um, uh, electricity generation, of course. Now, what are the critical parameters to control here? Uh, for the tandem devices, it's certainly um, the materials that you choose and the multiple interfaces that you have here. So you can already see that um, uh, this is not just absorber <laughs> one contact and the other contact. Uh, again, I want to, uh, to, to refer to, to Uwe here earlier today who said um, even one contact is a multi-layer uh, uh, multi interface where you have at least two um, uh, films. And again, this is something that we now start to rediscover for perovskite photovoltaics as well, where we play with um, bilayer structures and so on and so forth. So on the other end um, of the spectrum, of course, we have these hot carrier dynamics and as I uh, indicated, extraction through uh, selective contacts. Now, um, uh, these were really um, the goals, and I keep showing this uh, view graph here. Um, this is, uh, I, I, I like this paper by, from um, Kevin uh, Bush, uh, who did this in um, McGee's group. Um, and this is uh, one point that I want to ask you, um, the audience here, and this is 
uh, why the choice of nickel oxide at this interface? Say again, who was it? Inorganic coal transport layer. So um, would, what would be a different choice than nickel oxide? Excuse me, say it again. Uh, manganese sulfide. Manganese sulfide. Oh, wow, OK. Uh, copper oxide, OK. <laughs> yeah, uh, for instance, um, there is, um, I mean, copper oxide, it's on the, uh, I want to say, hot list. Problem is, of course, uh, parasitic absorption generally. So that is why you want to avoid it in um, uh, cells, because the band gap is not as uh, high. It seems to be not a, an issue one, once you're here, because you absorb all the high energy photons, ideally already in your perovskite uh, cell. Um, the point is, if you go and read into the pa uh, read the paper, they initially started with an organic coal transport layer. And it was um, uh, P dot, I think, uh, or PTAA. And um, the argument that is made, so uh, uh, believe me, the paper is really good, and the work is very strong, uh, is very very good. Um, what uh, what was unclear then is on uh, how this improved it, and it just made it uh, more stable, led to less hysteresis um, and more stable devices. Um, the, the point is you can use it because you can change the polarity of the perovskite cell. So I will talk about this a little bit and the means on how we got there. So um, the um, electronic uh, structure of the perovskite, uh, well, of course, the electronic structure is fixed, but um, some parameters like the Fermi level position is quite amendable to the choice of your um, interlayer here. And this is why I believe nickel oxide did not simply improve um, the um, uh, stability, but also um, really the extraction properties compared to an organic film. And uh, so how do we approach this? There is a um, multi-layered um, approach to look into those, um, uh, those um, issues. So uh, we um, uh, have this trifecta here where we um, uh, have this term that I loosely compiled as interface spectroscopy. Uh, we compare surface and interface properties uh, with photophysics, so uh, uh, absorption, recombination, uh, and so forth, and look into the impact of uh, the device characterization. And essentially, you have to hop in between those three areas in order to um, come to a more conclusive full picture. And I said that I <coughs> would explain a little bit more what I mean by interface spectroscopy. These are uh, mostly now uh, photoelectron spectroscopy techniques, uh, but also also X-ray absorption techniques that give you um, uh, first uh, a picture of the electronic alignment at these interfaces, but also very important uh, characterization of um, chemical species that can um, uh, appear at um, those newly formed interfaces. So, and uh, with this, I want to take it even a step um, back and go to really the fundamentals. So, surfaces and interfaces in material science, uh, what is it uh, or how do we actually um, define it? And uh, there are some uh, two famous quotes that I want to bring. So, by um, um, Herbert Krömer, Nobel uh, uh, laureate for um, his work on um, electron, uh, electronics, often it may be said that the interface is the device, which means that uh, if you make a, a semiconductor device, you only need to get your since only get to need your interfaces uh, figured out in order to uh, define the functionality and mode of operation uh, of this device. Uh, and then also famously by uh, Wolfgang Pauli said that God made the bike, surfaces were invented by the devil. Uh, the, there's a kernel of truth in this, of course, that is um, a theoretical physicist uh, can very nicely calculate bike properties if you have perfect periodicity you are in good shape and uh, your methods uh, work very well, but as soon as you introduce a surface, you have um, essentially a 2D defect that is a uh, break from um, this perfect periodicity that complicates uh, things. Um, so I'm uh, very happy to bring up this quote here because as I understand, Wolfgang Pauli was at this place here in, uh, this, uh, in this school in uh, Lille. Now, um, what does it mean now for our daily work on interfaces? Uh, what we have really is a boundary between two phases of matter or matter and vacuum. And we track exchange of particles. So atoms, ions, molecules, chemical reactions. We look into uh, charge. So um, uh, what is um, the transfer of electrons across these interfaces? Critically important, uh, obviously, for photovoltaics. Uh, then um, there's electronic excitation for organic um, um, PV. This is quite important. Um, but then there are also um, uh, points that are a little bit outside of the scope of uh, uh, our classical work, but work, but are nonetheless also important. That is uh, force and uh, heat, um, very important for degradation processes. Now um, we stick with the uh, simplified uh, picture, as I said it, um, and here for this uh, uh, prototypical thin film uh, cell, we start with an absorber and just two contacts, a bottom contact for um, uh, electron extraction and a top contact for hole extraction. Um, and this is the, um, uh, again, simplified energy diagram that I drew. 
And now I want to see if uh, you paid attention to uh, uh, Uwe's lecture from yesterday. What is the power output of this scheme here? They are, right, okay, wow, okay. So this really has an impact and uh, I think this is a good message to carry home. Um, nonetheless, there are some um, uh, points in here that are important um, for the device parameters and that we'd like to control. Because what we assume here first is photo excitation in the bulk and then um, more or less lossless transport um, to the interfaces. It's uh, uh, a point that I, I think Andrea um, um, brought up um, that you need to have your um, uh, absorber structure smaller than um, your um, average uh, diffusion time and. Uh, correlated to the lifetime of your carrier in the material. So we assume this is true for well uh, operating um, uh, PV materials. And now what can happen at this interface? Uh, so again, remember holes are like bubble in your water. They want to go up. So if you have an offset between your valence band and the absorber and uh, let's say a P-type transport layer like nickel oxide and there is this kind of gap you actually cause a barrier for electrons to be extracted which will show as a huge hit on your device characteristic mostly on um, the fill factor but also the short circuit current then what can also happen at the interface is that you don't align bonds properly so you generate um, defect states which means that even if your bulk is defect free because it's a good absorber at the interface you, you break um, the um, uh, uh, the fundamental uh, parameters that define the optoelectronic properties of a defect um, <coughs> uh, distribution in the uh, in the bulk, and you can generate states that are in the gap, and then eventually lead to short curie hall recombination at this interface region. And then uh, fourth a uh, fourth point that is. Um, and honestly not so important in um, classical PV, but um, uh, pretty much so if you work with um, uh, imperfect transport films or transport films with low conductivity, is that you can run into an issue to get carriers away from this interface and you eventually face either contact recombination uh, or back recombination when the uh, these uh, uh, carriers fall back into um, the absorber um, layer. Now, um, how does it actually now uh, work for perovskites and what can we do in order to control these um, different loss processes and loss mechanisms? One point is really, <coughs> excuse me, to um, determine the energy level alignment. Um, and for this, we need to assess band offsets um, and characteristic energies like um, the band gap, conduction band minimum, valence band maximum, electron affinity, and ionization energy. So. Um, in order to do this, you can see here this energy uh, diagram. This is the prototypical perovskite cell with the absorber, an organic hole transport layer, and uh, an ETL on the bottom. Usually the ETL here, titanium oxide, is uh, N-type. Uh, then you have your um, perovskite. Um, back then, people could, of course, measure the band gap uh, by optical means. But if this uh, corresponds to the single particle gap was uh, unclear at uh, uh, this uh, moment, um, then what does it mean for um, the placement of your, um, um, of your conduction band in the perovskite? Would there be a barrier between in order to, um, uh, that is um, uh, impeding electron transfer? Uh, and then on the other side, you have the organic hole transport layer. And um, there the alignment <coughs> Uh, inorganics is often described by um, uh, vacuum level um, alignment. Um, and if this holds true for this combination of materials, uh, again, unclear. And if you have an interface dipole that would shift the vacuum level, uh, where would it put your HOMO level in order to extract holes? Um, again, something that need to be um, accessed uh, experimentally. Uh, so I have a quick uh, question to, to the audience again. Who of you worked on uh, photoelectron spectroscopy techniques in the past or regularly? No, Andrea, Christoph, sure. Um, anyone else? Uh, okay, there are a few, um, <coughs> uh, a few points. So I um, want to, to raise this point about the uh, vacuum level alignment. So I think I do have a little bit of space over here. <coughs> now, if we assume is the vacuum level of one material, okay. and here is the vacuum level of another material, so these are two organics with a conduction well, LUMO level and HOMO level. And if you bring those two into contact you, and you don't have an interface dipole, that is you don't have any chemical reaction in between those two, uh, you would have this alignment and um, you would simply get uh, this kind of junction. Now what would, be the, what would happen if you change this a little bit and you have your conduction band here, your valence band here. So this is a high work function uh, material, and, um, uh, so strong acceptor, and this would be a donor. 
Now, if you would have this kind of situation, would you run into a problem, yes or no? Question to you. Okay. So, could I simply go ahead and draw it like this? No, and actually I cannot, and the point is really in here, because now you have occupied states over here that are higher in energy than unoccupied states here, and what you effectively get is transfer of electrons to uh, the um, <coughs> uh, to the acceptor. Um, this will eventually pull down the entire thing, including the vacuum level that gives you this dip over here, which constitutes an interface dipole. Okay. Good. And uh, with this, we now want to um, uh, look into some um, basics about um, the um, electronic uh, or electronic structure considerations um, that need to be made when we deal with hybrid materials because now we um, need to think in terms of inorganic uh, materials but also organic materials uh, for the electronic properties. And starting off, um, I <coughs> will go through this relatively quickly. It's a recap of what you've heard already, um, but it's um, uh, kind of uh, important to um, keep in mind. The inorganic semiconductor has strong interatomic bonds. So there's a strong overlap of uh, wave functions. You have these block wave functions that expand over um, uh, uh, space. Um, and um, thus, the electronic and optical properties are uh, following this long range order and structure. We usually have wide energy um, bands. Um, which you can see then in the density of states and not uh, discrete energy levels any longer. Uh, and charge carrier mobilities are on the order of uh, 100, and, uh, uh, 100 to 1,000 uh, uh, range uh, square centimeter per volt second. Uh, of course, <coughs> this uh, again is, is very simplified, right? Um, you can get other carrier mobilities, but uh, for instance, in uh, silicon at room temperature, you have uh, 1,400. So you can get in inorganic materials to high values relatively easy and the carriers are delocalized over the entire crystal. Now, <coughs> what does it mean if you um, try to make an interface in two inorganic uh, materials? Uh, I want to um, take this example. Andrea has talked about this yesterday at length, um, that you can generate um, uh, these uh, defects uh, at the interface, or you're actually very likely to generate it because it's impossible to perfectly uh, line up 10 to the 14 bonds per square centimeter. But probably you will uh, tell me differently. I mean, epitaxy people know how to do it. Uh, I'm not an epitext because I don't, <laughs> but um, it is difficult. We can agree on this. All right. <laughs> All right. So um, what would these um, defect states do for your um, uh, energy landscape here? Even if you have um, just a P-type materials or two P-type materials, uh, you could uh, introduce um, st um, these uh, states that would then lead to um, Fermi level pinning and can act as a recombination center. So this is this, uh, uh, the, the classical thing that could go wrong in this view graph that I showed earlier where you have these uh, uh, interface uh, defect states. Now, if you go to organic semiconductors, and this is actually one of the big strengths, uh, unfortunately, this is not what governs uh, uh, transport in, <coughs> uh, in perovskites. Um, but here you have a closed shell molecular body, so no dangling bonds, which means this scenario with the interface, uh, with the absence of interface dipodes, uh, holds true. We have no dominant interface, state, uh, interface uh, states, um, but there are, of course, some hits you take for transport. That is, um, uh, the localization of charge carriers leads to relatively low charge carrier mobilities. Uh, again, here, luckily now the perovskite behaves as an inorganic material. Really, it's the um, lead halide cage or metal halide cage that is uh, responsible for um, the transport uh, properties. Um, but in any case, here for the uh, organic part, the single electron approximation also breaks down. So now we come into a range where polarization on an individual molecular unit can distort um, the properties of the molecules around and transfer, um, transport uh, around these uh, molecules. So if we now move to um, this uh, uh, point here, I think this uh, slide rather comes from, um, uh, from an uh, OLED <laughs> slide because we're talking about uh, carrier injection into the material and not extraction, but it's just imagine it to be uh, the reverse of, um, uh, of a photovoltaic cell. Um, what you can see here is, however, that this one uh, charge will polarize um, the molecules around. This can be um, a spatial distortion of the molecules. Um, first of all, you have immediately electronic polarization. Um, this is a process that you uh, uh, cannot avoid. But then, due to the molecular structure, you can, when you have this charge on the molecule, distort 
the molecule. So you really get a rearrangement of uh, its structure. Um, that leads to um, uh, essentially a, a small structural defect um, that has often been treated as a polaron. Now, uh, in order to still access and measure these transport levels and to get to, the, uh, to energy alignment, uh, we will now discuss uh, photo emission spectroscopy uh, in the next, next uh, couple of uh, slides. So, um, to, to those of you who have not been, uh, you know, uh, have not been in touch with uh, photo emission spectroscopy, I here actually use the two words. Uh, don't get confused. Uh, I will confuse them over the talk, but um, it essentially means the same. It's it's really the same technique. It's just a little bit. Uh, uh, yeah, tradition, I want to say. So if you come from, uh, for instance, a German-speaking country, photoelectron spectroscopy feels way more natural because it's photoelectron spectroscopy in, in, in German. Um, but um, it's also a little bit community-related, so chemists rather uh, often say photoemission spectroscopy. But again, don't get confused. It's, a, it's the same thing. Now, what do we do? <coughs> we irradiate the sample with monochromatic light of a given energy. So we have specific light sources from which we know the emission lines. Um, and we measure the kinetic electron of the um, uh, energy of the electron that is emitted by the photoelectric effect. Now, these photo excited electrons carry information about um, the binding energy. And this is all summarized in, in this uh, equation here. Um, so, this is really the baseline for all uh, XPS, UPS data, and, that and so on that you see. Um, the kinetic energy of the electrons corresponds to the excitation energy minus the binding energy that has been. Uh, 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 that is uh, needed in order to release the electron from its bound state. Now, um, this distribution of the photoelectrons that we measure, I mean, you measure not just once, but it's depending on how many electrons there are. So what you get is a picture or a direct projection of the partial or projected density of occupied states. Of course, we can only measure electrons that are already there. There's a technique, I will come to this in a bit, inverse photoemission spectroscopy that is complementary to this approach uh, and gives you access to unoccupied states. Now, uh, eventually, the, the, the thing is more um, complicated. Um, you, you measure this distribution of photo-excited um, electrons, or sometimes also called EDC, electron distribution curve. And um, this is a convolution of excitation and emission. So it's an optical transition, if you want. And thus, you um, capture this ideally in an um, uh, equation that captures uh, Fermi's uh, golden rule. That is, you need to know the um, uh, the, the ground state and also the excited state with the electron being um, absent, so with the photo hole residing on this uh, place. Now, um, there is um <coughs> one small thing. Yeah, I actually want to bring it up. So there's one thing for organic electronics, for instance. I just said that if you ionize your material, it can rearrange. Now, the time scales for this rearrangement will show in um, this experiment because um, the electronic polarization, as I said, will happen immediately. Time scale of 10 to the 16, uh, minus 16 uh, seconds, and you will have this drop in energy uh, due to the electronic polarization. Now, the molecular reorganization that is rather on the time scale of uh, uh, phonon frequencies, not so clear if it uh, shows up, but the contribution is supposed to be on the order of uh, 100 milli electron volts or so, um, which means that uh, uh, it can be uh, factored into the accuracy of this measurement. Now, also these uh, uh, the electrons that are emitted do have a k-vector dependence. This becomes important when you go to single crystal studies, um, and you can even backtrack uh, by um, the uh, emission angle of your electron on what crystal momentum it had when it was uh, in the solid. Now, um, what does a system look like? So this is, uh, uh, yeah, unfortunately not at IPVF, but in uh, uh, Princeton, uh, where I um, uh, made um, the first um, joint measurements of uh, photo emission and inverse photo emission spectroscopy of um, halide perovskites, uh, uh, well, uh, the very first ones. <laughs> um, and um, there are some features I want to summarize. So uh, here you can see the processes for pho direct photo emission. I said this, incoming light and exiting emitted um, electrons. Here we get the occupied states. We can read off the valence band maximum. I will show you how this will be done. We can measure the work function. Again, I will show you how this is done. Uh, these two values together give you the ionization energy of your material. And then an inverse photoemission spectroscopy. Now here you shine low energy electrons onto your sample. They can um, uh, radiatively recombine with inoccupied uh, st uh, with inoccupied states by emitting uh, radiation. So here, of course, it's important to know the uh, energy of the incoming electrons. Uh, and this then gives you a probe of the unoccupied states, the conduction band minimum, 
And if you combine those two, so you have the conduction band minimum and the work function over here, you can derive the electron affinity of your material. So it's all there. And uh, the two together give you the electronic band gap that can, of course, differ from the optical gap if you have um, uh, excitonic effects, uh, for example, and is also referred to as the single particle gap. Now, um, let's get even uh, deeper into the instrumentation. This is how, uh, so uh, actually, it's not, yeah, no, no, I mean, this picture is correct. I'm just saying that in the Princeton system, for instance, we don't have a hemispherical energy analyzer, but this is usually how it's done. So uh, you can, this is the analyzer, which is these uh, the big metal um, half spheres are really the core um, piece of um, the, the equipment. And you are operating it as a capacitor, so you have those at different potentials, the inner sphere and the outer sphere. So if an electron is emitted through this lens system, then it, if it's too fast, it will crash, crash into the outer sphere. If it's too slow, it will crash into the inner sphere. And by changing uh, the, the, uh, the voltages on these sphere, you can um, uh, filter your electrons. Now, um, okay, to you. How would you now operate this piece of equipment? Let's say all the electrons at all different energies comes out. How can you now um, uh, filter the electrons coming onto the detector over here? So I essentially said it already, but um, uh, <laughs> I, I want to get into a very particular issue on how the measurements are done. Yeah, exactly. So you scan the voltage. So this would be the, the obvious way to do it, right? To just sweep the voltage of these spheres. The point is, you can do this, but then you are um, in a mode um, that is uh, not, um, so it's difficult because depending on um, the voltage, the path energy of um, the analyzer changes, which means if you're operating at high voltages, you only let through high kinetic energy electrons. And um, uh, these are, uh, give you a smaller yield. So if you're operating at low energies, you get a lot of electrons through this, uh, whereas at high energies, you get uh, only few through Excuse me, I'm actually, it's the other way around. So at low pass energies, you um, have more uh, uh, probability for the electrons to actually be filtered out. So at low pass energies, you have a very small yield, and at high energies, you're actually collecting a lot, but the accuracy of the system uh, becomes smaller because they reside uh, for a shorter period of time in this electric field. So you rather operate it in a, uh, um, uh, in a, a mode that is called FAT or fixed analyzer transmission where you set this path energy and therefore you have um, the transmission function of this um, uh, analyzer fixed. And what you do is you actually scan, or you sweep your voltage by these um, retardation lenses. So you uh, either accelerate or slow down the electrons before they get into, the slow, uh, into this uh, sphere. And in this way you can make actually quantitative analysis of your spectra. Okay, so but this is a very technical uh, detail. Um, <coughs> in addition, there are different um, uh, ranges of energy that you can uh, use for excitation, giving you different uh, pieces of information about your material. So if you go at, uh, if you say low excitation energies, you are uh, using UV, hard UV radiation, you get information about the valence band. And this usually with a very high uh, accuracy. If you go to high excitation energies, so uh, 150, or this is still distant V, I would call it, or very soft X-rays to um, hard X-rays, you get information of the deeper lying energy levels, which are the core levels, and those carry uh, a lot of uh, chemical information. Now with this um, uh, move, uh, I, I quickly have this uh, interlude here with inverse photoemission spectroscopy. Um, this is how the setup looks like. I don't want to go into detail here. It's also a vacuum system. Everything here is operated in a vacuum. We now have the electron gun and the detector. Um, you can say that um, these, uh, the distances are becoming very critical, so the years are small, so you need to get very close to your sample, which means if you want to do this measurement on your you know, big uh, solar module, it, um, the, the people who run those will probably say, uh, <laughs> okay, you have to, to cut it down. So these are all very specialized techniques for material analysis that you can then infer onto some, um, infer uh, solar cell characteristics. But <coughs> let me still uh, give you an overview on how IPS works uh, here in this uh, scheme. Um, there are various ways to detect um, the, the light and, and filter it. Here is, for instance, with a uh, more or less a gas detector. Uh, here is with a solid state detector where you have a channel tron, which is a photomultiplier. Um, and here you have your sample and here the electron gun. So electrons of low energy are impinging on the sample surface, emitting photons. Um, now you, have, um, you need to filter um, the photons by having this uh, 
strontium fluoride uh, window that um, acts as a um, filter with a cutoff at 9.7 eV. And you coat your channeltron with um, calcium, uh, sorry, potassium chloride. Um, this gives you um, a high uh, pass uh, filter with a cutoff at 8.6 eV. And this means you only capture photons that are in this energy range. And as you scan your different electrons, you um, uh, scan your um, unoccupied states. Um, so this is the so-called isochromat mode of um, um, the uh, uh, IPS measurement. Okay, we um, now switch gears back a little bit to um, the, the uh, photoemission spectroscopy, the direct photoemission spectroscopy, and look into <coughs> how a spectrum is derived in theory. <coughs> and of course, um, this needs some um, uh, recap of how um, the electronic structure looks like. We've um, uh, seen this now a couple of times. You have your... Uh, uh, your energy levels here with the vacuum level up here, the Fermi level, the distance making the work function. You have your conduction band minimum and your valence band maximum with the valence region and later on further down the core levels. Now um, I uh, turn off the, um, uh, valen uh, the conduction band minimum because as I said in direct photomission we're only looking into occupied states. Now what would happen if uh, you bring this system into contact with your spectrometer. And um, this is actually a very uh, important yet uh, very confusing part as well because you do have your sample work function but there is also um, a spectrometer uh, work function. And um, these are different levels of uh, different vacuum levels so to say. And this vacuum level is uh, different from um, the uh, vacuum level at infinity. So um, what is uh, what does vacuum level mean in this sense? It is a reflection of your surface potential, right? So um, in order to uh, emit an electron from a surface, you have to overcome this potential, and then the electron is emitted with a finite kinetic energy that is above the absolute vacuum level. So the technique cannot be used to measure the absolute vacuum level, but you get only um, these uh, reference or relative uh, vacuum levels as a um <coughs> uh, uh, contact potential difference, more or less. So the principle is very uh, close to that. Of course, this only works when the Fermi levels are aligned. So um, this needs to be reasonably conductive, um, and you need to uh, 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 bring them onto the same um, potential. Now, um, there is, uh, again, one point that you need to consider when you do these measurements. What would happen if um, the spectrometer work function would be larger than... Now, actually, so let me first show you the spectrum, and then I'll ask this, that question. Because what is now happening is we um, have the sample surface, we have the incoming light, and then the electron is going through the analyzer into the detector. So this I described already. What does it look like in energy space? You're actually giving this excess energy here from a, a shallow core level um, to the electron that is now um, higher in energy space and can move in, in energy space and be then registered in the spectrum that is now flipped 90 degrees, we will flip it back in a second. Um, but you can see that this electron now generates this peak over here. The valence, an, an electron from the valence band would go here and would show up at the valence band maximum here. And now, uh, very important, so this is the valence band maximum, you also have the secondary electron cutoff. So this is the electron with the least kinetic energy that still makes it up to this vacuum level and can escape to show here at the secondary electron cutoff. And now let me put this question again. What would happen if the work function of your spectrometer is higher than the work function of your um, semiconductor? Any idea? Could, yeah? Yeah, so the electron could actually not be detected. So it would be here and uh, you would not register the secondary electron cutoff. You would get a secondary electron cutoff that is only depending on the work function of your spectrometer. So in order to avoid this uh, scenario, what you actually do when you do the UPS measurement is you bring this to a higher potential by adding an additional bias. And um, this is also um, a very important point in general. Every bias that is uh, occurring in your sample, be it a surface photovoltage, be it the uh, photovoltage of your uh, photovoltaic material, or be it an additional bias, will show as a shift of um, your energy levels and um, can also result in a uh, faulty uh, work function evaluation. Okay, so I said already valence region by UPS, core level region by um, XPS. Uh, we stay a little bit in the theory and uh, in order to uh, make things a little bit more um, uh, perplexing, I <laughs> put up uh, this view graph here where you now have this um, spectrum, as I said, flipped as you would see it 
in a publication with a secondary electron cutoff defining um, the work function if you measure it uh, uh, the distance from here by the excitation energy to the vacuum level position um, the um, valence band maximum with respect to the Fermi level of your semiconductor material um, and those two so the um, uh, valence band maximum plus the work function give you the ionization energy now this is always calibrated to a metal uh, can be substrate but can also be a, a reference uh, sample where now the Fermi level is cutting through the um, uh, uh, through this um, edge here so uh, I'll have an example on the next slide um, and uh, here you are now uh, occupying electrons at zero EV binding energy now um, in practice how would you actually do it so we have a lot of spectrum today but uh, spectra today and uh, goal of this first part of the uh, lecture is really to um, bring you in a position that you can open a paper you see these kind of things and you can actually this is in the slides I assume okay good <laughs> um, uh, and bring you into the position that you can read it and uh, check the validity of the measurements and uh, claims that are made from these measurements so this is the UPS spectrum of a bare gold surface and um, First thing I want to reiterate, here you see, so these are the gold occupied um, gold D orbitals and here these are the um, gold S orbitals that have um, this uh, cut here, uh, threshold uh, if you want so, that defines the Fermi level. So this is where we um, uh, align our spectrum, spectra to, so it's energy, axis binding energy with respect to the Fermi level. This can also be referenced for instance to the vacuum level. And then here on this end we have the electron, uh, secondary electron cutoff. When we measure this, we now project the excitation energy on this and we can pr um, produce the vacuum level at this uh, energy here, which would correspond to 5.1 EV binding energy, which is what you find for um, polycrystalline gold surfaces that are sputter clean in vacuum. Now, uh, following um, uh, this, you have this work function, of course, excitation energy minus the Fermi level minus the secondary electron cutoff. Okay, so um, uh, some trivia before we go into uh, some uh, uh, homework, so to say. Um, you need to run this in ultra-high vacuum. So uh, elec the electrons would otherwise be um, uh, scattered. Uh, the UV light for UPS would be uh, absorbed um, and also your sample would be contaminated. So um, <coughs> you, you, um, there are air photo emission um, setups, but um, the reliability is, um, let's say, limited. Uh, you need magnetic shielding in order to prevent electrons to be uh, deflected and therefore be forced on a uh, trajectory that is um, giving a faulty signal read out in your detector, particularly um, uh, difficult for low energy electrons that can be um, uh, deflected by stray fields more easily. Um, samples need to be conductive, otherwise you have charging. And then, and this is key, it's a distinctively surface sensitive technique. So with UPS, um, First, let me get to this curve here. This is um, the so-called universal curve for the inelastic electron mean free path. It's uh, so a paper before I was born. I, uh, in order to keep this in a tradition of, uh, uh <coughs> of, the, uh, of the lecture series, uh, it's important to look into stuff uh, that has been uh, done before you were born. There was science. Um, we are here in this kinetic energy range and the mean free path is on the order of uh, uh, several angstrom. So the actual probing depth that you can achieve is on the order of one to two nanometer with this technique. Now with X-rays you are in this range, the mean free path is on the order of a few nanometers and uh, now you uh, get to an information depth of 5 to 10 uh, nanometers. And in IPS you are here in this range and uh, have um, a, a, a slightly larger range of, um, uh, of, of probing depth. Now um, the line width is really the thing that limits the resolution. Usually the detectors, it's not um, difficult, difficult to get milli or sub milli EV uh, resolution by the um, hemispheres, um, but you are limited by the line width of your um, UV discharge lamp, which is 10 milli electron volt. Uh, monochromatic X-rays on a lab, lab scale, you can get 300 milli electron volt. At a synchrotron, you can even go down to a few uh, milli electron volts. Of course, these limits only become important, or well, I mean these limits here, um, when you go to um, uh, cryogenic uh, temperatures. Now, Photoelectron spectroscopy, your turn. Uh, so I prepared a slide, uh, and it should show up in your uh, deck of slides, where you have uh, this view graph here. So um, these are two materials, this I can say, UPS curve and IPS curve, uh, regarding the binding energies with respect to the vacuum level. And I want you, I give you five minutes to give me the ionization energy, the electron affinity, 
the band gets. And if you can, tell me what is material A, the thing on top, and material B, the material on bottom. Okay, let's go. It's an experiment also for me, so. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> yes, please. Yeah. Uh, it was actually different materials, so that's why they call it universal. Turns out it's not that e easy <laughs> because uh, you have um, uh, electron phonon scattering that can vastly depend on the material that you uh, have. So it's not that universal, it's, um, it's been refined. Oui, mais je ne sais pas demander. C'est pas alors tu l'as déjà c'est tout mais c'est tu as vraiment besoin parce que ça ça tu as besoin de si tu veux voir le secondary electron cut off mais c'est pas indiqué ici et donc on ne peut pas extraire le travail de le travail de sortie c'est ça oui ça c'est pas dans le graphe Is there uh, anybody found the solutions already? No? So this is a UPS, um, uh, ultraviolet photo emission spectroscopy, and this is IPS, inverse photo emission spectroscopy. This one is UPS ultraviolet photoemission spectroscopy, and this is inverse photoemission
Donc, et voilà, cinq minutes. So we, uh, I want answers. <laughs> so, <clears throat> okay, um, let's uh, resolve this. Who found um, the ionization energies? And do you have any idea? Excuse me? Can you raise your hand so that I can? For the, for the red one? Right, so you would read it off <laughs> right from here. You go down here, and because it's diff distance to the vacuum level, the work function is already factored in, right? So what you read off here is not just the valence band maximum because the Fermi level is not indicated, but you actually get the ionization energy right away. And uh, for the blue curve, thus it would be rather here at uh, uh, 4.3, 4.4, 4.5. Okay, great. Um, also let me, uh, so it is an indication. Everything you see on this side here is direct photoemission spectroscopy, UPS. Everything that you see on this side is inverse photoemission spectroscopy, IPS. Now what are the electron affinities of these two materials? For this one, right, so here is, you can see the small dot that has still been in here, and you read off the conduction band offset to the vacuum level, or onset, and it's 3.6, and for the blue curve, Two, exactly. So, well, I mean, it's a rather here, so 2.2. Uh, 2. So, what is the band gap of the two materials? Say, see? Yes, roughly three, roughly two. So, this is how you can read these spectra and extract these kind of information right away. Now, any guess, what's the material A on top? Semiconductor, that's uh, good. Right? Yeah. No, I mean, no, no, it could also, I mean, this is actually critical. If, it, um, if this here, look, if this here would be, uh, the Fermi edge would cut through this, it could actually be a metal, right, or a very degenerate um, semiconductor. So it's um, uh, kind of implicitly in here. <coughs> okay, so that's also good because the, uh, if you compare those two and you would align them to a common Fermi level, you would see that here the conduction band is closer to the Fermi level, which makes it an n-type. Uh, semiconductor. It's actually uh, an organic molecule, a fullerene C60 type molecule, um, ICBA. And the blue curve, what is that? It's uh, also an organic molecule. Um, here it's a rather P type donor polymer, P3HT. Yeah. So uh, I uh, want also to um <coughs> show the uh, so the, the full, so this is what it, it actually looks like in the paper, and what I uh, took out. So here now you have all the guidelines. Red is the IC, ICBA. You can see how they read off the um, uh, HOMO level or ionization energy, the LUMO level or um, <coughs> uh, electron affinity for those two materials um, on a common vacuum level. And the idea of this entire paper, when you want to look it up, yes, please. Was there a question or yes, please. Uber. Yes, they are two different setups. How, how, many, how do you manage to get a single curve? Yeah. Origin. <laughs> origin, I go. So, yeah, you're taking the measurements really from two different, um, uh, two different types. And um, we brought off an excellent point that is that um, the noise level seems to be very different. And um, that's the resolution and the yield that you get in these diff two de techniques is very different. Different. So when um, uh, I, I think the signal, no, I, the signal to noise ratio in IPS is roughly a hundred times worse than it is in um, direct photoemission spectroscopy, and this is related to the way that you can collect this low energy, uh, well, high energy radiation inside your uh, vacuum chamber, and also the generation of this radiation by the uh, recombining um, electrons. This is actually the main part. Uh, and then you, you have these two data sets, you put them together, and then you can plot it as one curve. I usually, uh, so I will show examples later where I was not that artful, I had two <laughs> uh, plots that I stitched together, but the information conveyed in these are the same. Okay, so yeah, this was a, a small um, exercise on um, uh, energy level alignment, and um, now we want to look into um, chemical analysis by XPS, which is also uh, very important, and I try to, um, to, to demonstrate the universal um, application or appli applicability of this technique by going deliberately out of the world of photovoltaics and looking into polyester fabric. 
So XPS is really used by um, uh, a broad swath of uh, researchers and domains um, looking into archaeology and uh, geology and so on. And it gives you an indication of what sort of chemical, uh, um, uh, chemical species and elements you have present in your surface. So it's therefore also often referred to as electron spectro spectroscopy for chemical analysis. This is uh, even a more historic name for XPS. And it allows you, as I said, to get the stoichiometry and chemical composition. Um, you have and uh, you can get this information because the elements at the have, um, core levels at very specific binding energies. It's a um, little bit inverse to um, uh, X-ray fluorescence, if you want so, or uh, emission lines from um, X-ray sources, uh, laboratory X-ray sources in anode. Um, and you can see um, so-called survey spectra of a broad energy range from zero to uh, it's hidden here thousand something uh, EV, and you can see these sharp lines that correspond to individual species like fluorine, oxygen, and carbon. And what they did here is the red curve is this fabric where you have um, only carbon, more or less, and uh, I think also some oxygen. Yeah, oxygen and carbon, so some organic molecule. Um, and then they treat it with a surfactant that contains nitrogen, fluorine, silicon, sulfur, and they can now identify um, these by, by finding these peaks, the silicate, uh, the sulfurous nitrogen and uh, fluorine in the green curve for the treated sample. So um, this gives you an indication of what is actually on your sample and um, uh, and, uh, qualitatively, but you can go deeper and do a quantitative analysis from um, the peak area. And here it is important to know that the peak, the area under the peak is actually uh, proportional to the concentration of the element in the composition. So. Uh, what you essentially only need to do is to, to measure the um, area under the peak and compare those two, uh, each to another uh, in order to get this um, uh, overall stoichiometry. Of course, it's a little bit um, more complicated as always. There is involved a photo emission cross-section because each orbiter follows a, a selection rules that gives it a different um, emissivity, so to say, from um, uh, for photoelectrons and also the electron mean free path. So electrons in this range here carry, have a low binding energy and are thus high in kinetic energy and uh, uh, therefore you will see um, uh, they pass through the material more easily whereas low energy electrons here in this part of the spectrum are rather attenuated. Uh, and you need to consider all these factors into getting the um, intensity from this XPS measurement. Now um, we uh, go to a more um, specific aspect of um, this, and this is um, the, to determine the chemical environment and oxidation state of um, individual species. What you see here is um, a carbon uh, molecule, I think, this, so this is some uh, a fluorinated uh, uh, acetate uh, species, where um, you have different binding energy peaks. So I must um <coughs> excuse a little bit so this um, uh, again, this is work that has been done before I was born. So the notation is a bit uh, unusual for nowadays, uh, so for today's XPS spectra, because they put, uh, it's a gas uh, emissions, uh, so a gas uh, emission spectrum as well. They put zero at the binding energy of uh, 291.2 EV. So this is also not even considering the, the work function. Um, and then they um, see the different peaks at different, um, relative different position from this main peak. And now you can see that each of these peaks correspond to a different carbon atom in the spectrum. So all you see here is only carbon, but here it's carbon emitted from this species. This is carbon emitted from this species. Uh, this here is uh, carbon emitted from this species, and this is carbon emitted from the fluoridated, uh, fluorinated species. And this is all to do with um, the uh, electron negativity of the adjacent groups and how many uh, or how their propensity to draw electrons from the carbon and therefore give it a different chemical environment and a different binding energy. And of course, this is not just uh, uh, you don't need to stick to only carbon. You can look into uh, silicon, for instance. So these are silicon to P level. This is actually not in the slides. Of course, you will, uh, well, it's in the slides, but not in your de uh, deck of slides, <coughs> um, where you have the 2P contribution for metallic silicon or for, for pure silicon. And here you have the same core level for oxidized silicon. And you can, if you do a, a refined fit, you um, look at this at here, lower path energy, so higher resolution, but also high, um, worse signal to noise ratio. You can make a deconvolution of these um, uh, species. Uh, and if you're really good at it, you can also deconvolve this um, silicon 2P oxide and determine 
if it's um, SiO2, SiO, uh, and or the different um, suboxides. Now I want to give you another example. This is um, uh, really on what uh, uh, I used to do uh, back when I was uh, doing um, uh, research on um, monolayer formation on metal surfaces. So uh, this is uh, almost no application in a real world PV device, but it's a, a very powerful means to show you on um, uh, what sort of um, information we can extract for the chemical uh, bonds at uh, modified contacts. What you see here is a so-called uh, thiolate absor uh, absorbate. So it's an ethylene group with a thio so sulfur-containing group. Um, and we deposit this on a gold surface. Um, and now this sulfur species can be at different positions. So here it would be um, bond to, uh, still to the ethylene and to the gold. The green ones are sulfur atoms that split from the molecule and uh, are just sitting on the gold surface. And blue are thiolates that are sitting on top because they did not find a proper binding place. And all these give you different contributions to the XPS region of the sulfur 2P peak, uh, peak. Now, if you change the, um, the pattern so that you um, uh, make sure that you don't lose um, uh, sulfur, that everything sticks to the surface, uh, you get this nicely lined up and you uh, uh, have maybe only a few uh, sulfur uh, containing <coughs> molecules on top, fizzy sorb, you can get a more clear um, and um, a sharper line of only these species here. And by this deconvolution, you can derive on um, uh, which case you are. And uh, in here, it's a little bit even more clear. So that's a um, dithiolate. So you have sulfur on both ends of this molecule. And you can have this binding pattern if you have a very dilute film so that it can lie down on the gold surface. And every sulfur is connected to gold. So you get only this peak here. Or you have a very dense film if you amp up the concentration. And now all the sulfur here sticks to the gold substrate. And you have always one sulfur sticking out, giving you equal contributions between the red, the sulfur sticking to the gold, and blue, the sulfur hanging in the air. So this is how you extract information about charge transfer, coordination, oxidation states from XPS spectra for individual species. Um, time. I do have. 20 minutes, I think? Yes. Okay. Well, 15 plus a 20 bit. Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <coughs> I, I've, I've been put on uh, warning. <laughs> Good. So um, I uh, have this in here as um, rather. Um, so I, I won't go into, uh, into detail this. And um, the, you will find the reference also in the slides that will be provided as a PDF. But um, an important point to take away from this. Uh, crowd method is to um, not just determine band bending of semiconductors at the surface, because you can um, now measure the valence band offset as a function of um, your um, uh, core level. And this is rooted in um, the, the principle that um, what, what we said earlier, you can't have a semiconductor bands bending in different directions. So uh, you would open the band gap if you do so. Um, and also, all the core levels actually follow the direction of um, your, your valence band if you change your Fermi level. Um, this, of course, um, you need to accept um, chemical reactions that would only show uh, up here, uh, in, but, but not uh, in, in, the, um, in the valence band. But this is a, a different um, uh, point. Um, in any case, you by tracking now the, the core level binding energies and looking into um, the bending towards the surface, uh, you can uh, infer the position of the valence band maximum by knowing the relative difference between the binding energy of this core level to the valence band maximum. Um, again, um, this is a, there's a lot of detailed calculations in this paper that I can uh, refer you to if you want to uh, look into this in more detail. So um, I had another exercise, but we have to skip this, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, so, like, oh, okay, now I actually have to, because I had the solution for this already in here. Wah! Okay, no. <laughs> okay, you didn't see anything. All right. <coughs> Let's come to uh, the last part of. <laughs> Did you see it? No? Okay, good. <laughs> okay. The last part of my talk, uh, I will take uh, a few shortcuts here in order to stay on time and uh, uh, only um, highlight uh, a selection <coughs> of uh, results. Halide perovskites, is it all about the interfaces? Now, uh, we've discussed this. This is all that we've been talking about before is to make these kind of view grams and bind diagrams. So how effectively can we do this? Um, and uh, for, for this, we, uh, we take the knowledge that we now assembled and we um, perform photo emission spectroscopy studies, direct UPS-XPS, and also inverse if we uh, can, on a perovskite 
absorber. And remember, it's a very, these are surface sensitive techniques, so we we'll only capture the electronic chemical properties of the surface. And this perovskite has been deposited on the transport layer, like titanium oxide or nickel oxide, that has been usually used in a perovskite uh, photovoltaic device. Now, um, the goal is really to understand the formation of the interface and then also to design interfacial layers for. Um, uh, well, okay, so this is already a little bit, huh, so this gives away the result. <laughs> uh, but what we want to improve, of course, is uh, charge extraction at these interfaces. And in order to do this, you first take your, your reference spectrum of the uh, perovskite surface and then you um, uh, sequentially grow layers on top. So you increase, so you deposit points by evaporation, uh, a layer on top, on a very, very small um, uh, scales in order to see how this interface is building. And the probed overlayers that we looked at were um, organic semiconductors, so the typical hull transport materials in, um, uh, in perovskite cells, uh, but also high work function oxides, um, single world carbon nanotubes, can use self assembled monolayers, like the stylates that I showed you before. You need to go to a different chemistry though. Um, and then also oxide layers by um, <coughs> the more, um, I mean, the technique is not exotic, but it's um, uh, not as readily done in, uh, in this community uh, by atomic layer deposition in oxide, for instance. Now, um, this is how uh, it looks like. Um, in order to uh, keep you in track, if you get lost, I always have this small cartoon up here to show what system we are currently talking about. Mm, and what you see here are um, the uh, stitched together spectra of um, uh, by, uh, measured by UPS and IPS of methyl ammonium lead triiodide. And we start off um, uh, with the black curve only. Here you have the secondary electron cutoff that gives you the work function values. Here you have the valence band maximum. Um, I, I said yesterday these materials have very low density of states at the band edges, so very hard to fit. Um, maybe I have a small thing on this later. Uh, in order to uh, give you the valence band maximum. And now you start evaporating spiral omitad on top and making a thickening layer and repeating this measurement in order to build up the, um, the and, and track the change of the work function and the alignment of the valence band and conduction band. Uh, so, but I can already tell you that at the conduction band there, it was actually not too much to see. Now, um, this gives you an idea on how the valence band uh, of <coughs> the spiral layer um, tracks with respect, or the HOMO level, with respect to the valence band maximum in the perovskite. Now, you can also do XPS measurements. And now going back to the crowd method, what you look at here is the lead 4F core level. So this, the lead, of course, is not in the newly formed overlay. This is just organic, but it's only in this now buried uh, perovskite cell. And if you see any changes in the position of this core level, you can um, backtrack a change in the Fermi level position in the perovskite, right? So um, maybe I should <coughs> make a very small, short uh, biograph for this. So <coughs> what you have here is your intensity, uh, photo emission intensity. So this is all XPS as a function of um, uh, binding energy, and let's say this uh, lead 4F peak is here. And um, now in our band diagram, we would have the vacuum level here, uh, the conduction band of the perovskite, uh, the Fermi level, and then the valence band, and down here, so this is a long break, so this is really deep in energy, you would have your PB4F core level. Now, once you start making a layer on top, so this here is a uh, space coordinate um, going along uh, the uh, Z coordinate of your Z coordinate of your um <coughs> uh, device. You now introduce the, um, uh, the whole transport material that is, uh, now you align the, uh, uh, the Fermi levels uh, and then because you have uh, everything on a common Fermi level, you would have the conduction band offset here. So the LUMO level, you would have the valence band hopefully somewhere there. So this is LUMO, this is HOMO. And um, now if there would be some sort of charge transfer and band bending induced in the perovskite, you could, for instance, see something like this happening, band bending. Now, um, this kind of information is completely screened in uh, IPS and um, UPS because you don't have any sort of chemical sensitivity here. So you can't tell if the electrons that you collect here are coming from the perovskite or coming from um, the organic material. 
but for the LED 4F, you know it's coming from the um, perovskite. So what you actually see is then this band bending. So if there is no band bending, then the LED 4F peak would look like this. It's a little bit attenuated, thus I made the intensity slow, uh, smaller. But if there is band bending in this direction, exactly, it would look like this. Is this uh, clear? <coughs> so, and um, here, by the absence of these shifts, we can say that there is no band bending in the perovskite layer underneath, or that we did not change the band bending that was there to begin with by producing the layer on top. Yes, there's a question, please. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, so um, what, I, what I said here, so the, the sh shift of the core level gives you an indication on how the valence band in the buried uh, layer changes. You run into problems, of course, when you start um, to get intermixing between species and uh, when you make new um, uh, chemical species. So then it's not uh, working uh, anymore, but the absence of any change here tells you that there is no change in the band, uh, in the buried uh, perovskite band. Say here? Yeah, no, yeah exactly. Here? Here? Uh, here, uh, here, yeah. Well, I mean, so this is negligible, right? Okay, so uh, here, this, uh, sh if you see a ch shift here, this is like 50 milli electron volts. Uh, the accuracy, to absolute accuracy is on 300 milli electron volts, and you can maybe make out shifts that are bigger than 100 milli electron volt, and then we can talk. But if it's smaller, then uh, you, um, uh, you, you can't see it here. Yeah. No, uh, so I not from what I see from this measurement because it's uh, the accuracy doesn't allow to extract this, yeah. which actually is um, if you're looking into small band bending on the order of tens of milli electron volts, this is not the technique you can do, use. Okay, but what is the result of these? Okay, so there are some questions. So maybe first. We even measured it, so yeah, so you're right. You can see a little bit of attenuation here, but you would expect it to be attenuated way more if you're already eight nanometers thick. The point is that you don't form a, a conformal layer, right? So you have, uh, I think there was, oh yeah, here, so this is actually a uh, perfect representation. This is what you actually get, and you're collecting then from uh, thinner parts. It's, um, in this sense, uh, uh, qualitative study. We've done this also for ALD films that cover the perovskite very uh, conformal, and then after uh, four nanometers, you see nothing of the perovskite anymore. Yeah. Okay, Stefania, one short one. Yeah, how do you describe the uh, well, I mean, so this is what, um, you know, uh, when, when this is an organic electronics, you, you just set very low um, uh, rates, and it's not a closed layer, so you have individual molecules sitting on the surface. And you will see, I will show um, a slide maybe where we have 1.5 angstrom of molybdenum oxide. This is also not a closed layer, for sure. Okay, so all this can be summarized. And no, actually, so I did not talk about the results here. So first, there's actually no interface dipole. When you have the first few molecules on top, you see that there is no change in work function, which means that the vacuum levels are actually aligned. Now the second step is that the, va uh, the HOMO level is below in energy space, or well, ab above in the sense, the valence band maximum of the perovskite, which means that there is no barrier for charge extraction. And then the third part is that there is no band bending in the perovskite. Now the big, big question was what we did here, is this actually relevant for uh, perovskite uh, solar cells? Um, and in order to do this, it's first uh, uh, valuable to, um, uh, to, to summarize this in this uh, now uh, stitched together band diagram where we have the n-type titanium oxide um, and a perovskite layer that seems to be n-type. Um, this can be a little bit of a faulty analysis depending on uh, band, band uh, so Fermi level pinning. And then we have this p-type hole transport layer with this offset of 0 0.4 um, uh, eV. And uh, our, uh, so definitely not a barrier to extract holes. But what we were always assuming is that this is now missing as um, uh, open circuit voltage. Um, and uh, so I, if I had seen uh, this uh, lecture before uh, we had written this uh, paper, I would have known that it's uh, not directly um, uh, related to a loss in open uh, circuit voltage. Uh, but back then we were curious if uh, this is, would, you know, 
uh, constitute a part of um, a voltage that you don't have in the solar cell any longer when you make this interface. And in order to, um, to look into this more closely, people actually did the experiment and compared it with uh, materials with different whole transport materials. Uh, actually, so, sorry, I have to say, this notion comes from, um, uh, really from OPV, where um, uh, an offset of the donor acceptor material constitutes a real loss in open circuit voltage because now you have um, uh, um, uh, the, the separation of the exciton leads to free carriers of uh, lower levels. <coughs> but not so much here, we will see. Here what they did is they, starting with a spirometer, which has this offset of 0.4 EV in ionization energy between uh, the on organic molecule and the perovskite, they sampled different uh, whole transport materials with different ionization energies and could see VOC and the efficiency to peak when you made these uh, part, uh, when you aligned those energy levels. So um, there were follow-up studies and I want to point out one uh, particular here from uh, Rebecca Belal where they um, repeated this and saw no change in the open circuit voltage that was uh, uh, significant. Uh, except if you go into a scenario where your uh, valence band is really deeper, uh, the HOMO level is really deeper than the valence band of your perovskite, now you are in a regime where you can't extract holes as well any longer and you get a, a, a really faulty curve with uh, 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 the stubble diet behavior, uh, sh small short circuit current and a hit in uh, fill factor. So. Um, the um, immediate result was that we don't have uh, see any impact on the open circuit voltage, but if the ionization energy of the whole transport level is larger than the ionization energy of the used or employed um, halide perovskite, uh, then you will get an interface barrier that would impede your um, uh, extraction. Okay, uh, so I said I run you through a few slides uh, quickly. We um, looked into uh, the energetics of MAPI layers, not just, so in orange, not just on titanium oxide, but also here in the black curve on nickel oxide. You could see uh, uh, first a jump in the work function. This could be related to a slightly different arrangement of uh, surface dipoles. It was a little bit uh, uh, puzzling because the material otherwise were really the same, the MAPI deposited on top of the two materials. Um, but you also saw a shift in the core levels, in these shallow core levels, and in the valence band maximum by the same amount. Now, this could still be an artifact. So if you would have charging in one uh, part uh, and not in the other, you would see a shift of um, the Fermi level only um, for the orange curve that would offset your um, spectrum from the spectrum that you get in the case where you have a good connection of the film. Now, if you concurrently run IPS measurements, you can confirm the band gap um, and exclude that char charging is happening. So here we saw that the same shift, these 0 0.6, 0 0.7 EV, uh, are occurring in the conduction band as well. So the two different uh, systems here, MAPI on titanium oxide and MAPI on nickel oxide, um, constitute uh, a surface that appears to be either N-type on titanium oxide or uh, intrinsic or slightly P-type on um, nickel oxide. Um, I uh, should use these uh, terms with care because it's not really doping. We don't know uh, how doping works in uh, perovskite, so if they can be doped uh, at all, so uh, there we need to go um, deep into defect science uh, and uh, change of uh, paradigms uh, uh, even in order to uh, make this assessment. Um, in any case, also bear in mind the techniques are surface sensitive and the perovskite film is 400 nanometer thick. So we only get signal from the first two nanometers, the surface, but the electronic properties are determined by how you made your bottom substrate and in um, the case of nickel oxide you force it to be um, intrinsic or slightly p-type and this is also why you could use nickel oxide easily in the tandem configuration and make a PIN uh, junction for the perovskite on top of um, a silicon that is terminated with an N-contact. Now um, we can go ahead and uh, repeat these measurements where you um, now make um, a C60 electron transport layers on top and you extract those parameters. Um, due to time reasons, I will skip to this and also through this and bring you to the final slide where um, the two um, cases are summarized. So um, here we do have <coughs> the um, conventional uh, geometry with the ETL on the bottom, MAPI and Spiro on top, and here the inverted case with uh, the P-type nickel oxide on bottom and MAPI on top. And if you make these uh, um, estimated band diagrams, you um, run in both cases um, in, uh, uh, in scenarios where you do not see um, the buildup of a barrier, uh, significant uh, barrier 
um, that would impede extraction properties and uh, host the functionality of your device. Uh, we are not talking about optimization of fill factors that are uh, rather reliant on um, small miniature of um, uh, edge states, uh, tail states at, at these interfaces and uh, band bending as uh, should I, uh, should I um, erase it uh, uh, due to different doping profiles and so on. Um, but this ensured that functionality is possible in both configurations. Okay, so um, I think I have to cut it short at this uh, point in time. Um, so uh, if you are interested in more on this, like we did molybdenum oxide layers, we uh, did uh, carbon nanotubes, so, uh, so I'm not talking about this, right? Uh, <laughs> if you want to, to know more about this, um, it's all summarized for the control of the Fermi level on device operation and alignment on organic transport layers, um, interfaces to high work function oxides, so uh, spoiler alert, they're very <coughs> reactive and cause a problem. Um, this is um, in particular if you have molybdenum oxide in direct contact with methyl ammonium lead triiodide or uh, uh, halide based perovskite, you see um, a reduction of the molybdenum oxide and oxidation of the perovskite, uh, introducing interface states that really pin your Fermi level to, um, uh, to these interface states. You can see this in a shift of your core levels. And then uh, if you use uh, somewhat more exotic materials like uh, uh, carbon nanotubes, uh, you can. Um, uh, observe rapid charge carrier transfer that is promoted by the way uh, the um, energy levels are bent in the carbon nanotube layer. Okay, and uh, as I said, it's all summarized in here. You have this in your slides. And from the, uh, from the previously statement, it is all about the interfaces. We really moved to, is it all about the interfaces? Because there were a lot of open questions. And uh, I want to skip to um, one more slide before I go to the final part. <coughs> And this is uh, this one here, where um, <coughs> we, um, okay, so this is also on your slides, I assume, um, where we looked into um, reaction of noble metal contacts with methyl ammonium lead uh, triiodide uh, perovskites. Um, and what is interesting here on the bottom, you have, uh, let me get this away once more, a MAPI layer with a thin gold layer on top and a PVA2 layer with a thin gold layer on top. Um, and these are just XPS scans of the lead 4F core level region at um, taken right when you uh, make, uh, f so this is the first initial measurement, the first 10 seconds. And then you repeat the measurement every uh, few minutes. And what you can see is the formation of metallic lead. So even the material, as innocuous and uh, inert as gold uh, should be, can induce a chemical reaction at this interface leading to um, a profound uh, landscape of uh, defect states that would be left there. Um, most uh, uh, critical, you will form a metallic uh, lead that can act as a donor defect um, and thus pin your Fermi level to the conduction band. <coughs> and this is actually not happening in this case when you have only PBI2. So um, this was a little bit curious to us on why that is. It was actually also not happening if you did not have the gold on top. Now um, it becomes a little bit more um, uh, or it reveals itself when you look into uh, thin uh, mapillas on top of gold. So these are more or less, uh, when you grow gold on top of perovskites, you will always find uh, the methyl ammonium that triiodide species, or uh, a monolayer at least, on top of the surface on which you can do beautiful surface signs. And here we see the loss of um, iodine due to the formation of um, uh, hydronic um, um, acid. It's actually a very strong acid. So why do certain oxides not work? particular because you make a very acidic uh, uh, environment in perovskite, so uh, uh, this will start then um, etching your oxides. Um, and this loss of HI uh, leaves you with under potential deposited um, PB2+, um, and thus metallic PB. And uh, so this is really all to, to Ross, who did a phenomenal job at uh, uh, Princeton and uh, back then also at, um, at, at NREL, um, where he looked into this reaction. So if you're in the perovskite, you have lead in a 2-plus state, and you have oftentimes amines that are not completely reacted and in the perovskite structure. Now, these amines can form a very loose bond with the lead, um, but uh, if you have now a second amine coming to, uh, into this equation, they can catalyze and take away uh, or deprotonate um, this compound, leading this, uh, to this lead amide component, which is very sensitive to X-ray radiation and will uh, eventually uh, break apart. And you are also left with ammonium, which is also very volatile and will go into vacuum. Um, and by um, a very delicate um, balance between um, uh, free amides, you can um, 
uh, tailor this interface. Oh, I mean, okay, so this is a prospect. Obviously, we did not manage to, uh, <laughs> to, um, to perfectly tailor it, but to change at least the amount, and therefore uh, change the propensity of forming these let zero defect states. Okay, so it's uh, a bit more than just uh, uh, band alignment. It's a lot of um, interfacial chemistry. You can measure ferroelectricity, but this is uh, that. And what, so uh, if you want to read more and if you have too much time on your hands, there is this uh, <laughs> review paper. It's uh, almost uh, 70 pages about all the different interfaces you um, have in perovskite solar cells and uh, uh, perovskite-based um, semiconductors uh, with links to uh, work that has been done in order to, to look into these individual points. And today I hope you could take away um, that the energy level alignment process in perovskite solar cells is dominated by the complex interface and interlayer design is required in order to stabilize your material film and uh, devices. So. Um, <laughs> so I tried to sneak this in again, but uh, no, <laughs> no time to talk about perovskite quantum dots. We have to do this offline. Um, or you can also read this paper, uh, which was a follow-up to the um, to the record uh, that we made. Now a little bit more focused on the science behind it. Uh, this is uh, so. Uh, Work I could do here is part of the Make Our Planet Great Again initiative by uh, President uh, Emmanuel Macron. Um, it's also funding the Interface and Hybrid Materials Group at um, IPVF. Uh, I should be more active on Twitter, so I've <laughs> been told I <laughs> need to uh, improve this. And uh, since this, uh, so I always say this sounds uh, as if it were made up, but um, this has actually allowed me to get here. This is a picture taken at um, uh, the Elysee Palace with also a representative from Ecole Polytechnique and from the Institut de Chimie of uh, CNRS. Uh, so there is follow-up work on this really, so it's, it has happened. And uh, <laughs> so, yeah, you know, there's a big crowd and you just try to get in and uh, sneak out a selfie. And, um, the, but what is uh, beautiful about this is that it's a growing movement, right? So this was the kickoff conference in October um, last year in um, Paris, which uh, Jean-Francois and I had um, uh, the big opportunity to attend to. Oh, I have to cut it short. Okay. All right. So that's it. Uh, sneak in some mix. If you want to present your, uh, uh, your results in either the EMRS4 meeting in Warsaw or the MRS4 meeting in, uh, uh, in, in Boston, please do so. And uh, with this, I... Thank you, Thank you very much.